moving into the um, second chapter. Now, this chapter is worth 15%, um, which isn't that much. But and what I'm going to focus on is this kind of two key things. The first thing is kind of the concept of a differential equation, which will be massive in our third chapter, which is really the big story of this module. Um, I want you to be able to kind of understand... Um, you know what a differential equation is what a solution of a differential equation is and if you if you don't understand that you're you're kind of in trouble for chapter three so in that sense um chapter two is prerequisite to chapter three the other thing that's kind of the of theoretical background and we'll see it in, in this lecture or maybe the next one is the idea of an ansatz so an ansatz is basically where you have a situation where you know possibly the form of the solution or you know theoretically you know the, the dimension space of this what that basically means is how many solutions there are and what you do is you basically chance your arm you try and force things to solve in this case the differential equation and you end up with these equation uh, these equations in the unknowns uh, we'll see this and you figure them out it's called uh, the method of undetermined coefficients so um, that's something which I'm fairly sure you're going to see uh, if you move into level eight and even into level nine, where you you do what's called an ansatz. So that's why this uh, chapter is important. Otherwise, it's actually not that important. We, we could go straight into chapter three, but I think you could be a bit lost if you didn't put it some time into this. OK, so what we're going to talk, we're just going to there's one thing we're going to be analyzing throughout this. Now, it's not. A civil or structural engineering thing but it's something that we can all kind of uh, talk about so if you have this is a door closer now we can we're going to massively simplify the situation and um, basically what you have here in this part of the component basically is a spring okay and what you have here is basically a damper okay um well we're not gonna have the damper at the moment excuse me so i forget about the damper right so just the spring imagine the door closer is just made uh with the spring now what we have is and i don't know where it's going to be written down okay let's let's just sorry i'm a bit lost there for a second uh yeah so we're going to imagine the door closer in one uh, dimension now um you can kind of do this so here's the door and here's the door frame and you're imagining there's a spring and you're like how is that a door closer well essentially what you do is you just change coordinates like so if here's the uh here's the wall and here's the door and the door is kind of swung open there's the door frame i think uh, and so you kind of the one dimension it's circular coordinates so it's like this. So how far the door is along that semicircle there. So when the door is closed, uh, that will be kind of the neutral position of the spring. There'll be no force. But if the door opens, uh, the spring is going to be stretched. And when a string is stretched, it has a restoring force in the opposite direction to the displacement. So this would be the displacement and this would be the spring force. And uh, Hooke's law says that the force is proportional to the displacement. And so here you get Hooke's law says that the force minus because it's in the opposite direction, K because it's proportional times X. And actually, we're going to be interested in the position as a function of time. OK, so what are we going to write here? Assume that the door is swinging freely. The only force closing the door is the force of the spring. Hooke's law states that the force of the spring is blah, 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 blah. So the force, yeah, we're just going to write in what we wrote a moment ago. So the force at time t is minus k times the displacement. Now, what do we want our door closer to do? It should close the door, obviously, but we want it to close it gently. You don't want the spring to really ram the door closed and have it uh, slam against the frame. Or if there's no frame, we don't want the oscillations. That's bad. Uh, we want it to close as fast as possible so it doesn't take all day long either. So let's look at our spring one. 
uh, it can be shown that this system and we won't worry yet but that does close the door but the balance between closing the door gently and closing the door quickly is lost indeed if you let go of the door like this the speed of the door will have the following behavior so this is um released at rest for say maybe so this is a time equal to zero maybe the x the displacement is some kind of a, max, a maximum and the velocity is zero and then eventually at this time when the door is closed so the door is displacing the zero the, the the velocity is at its maximum so a spring if you if you just design it with a spring a, the door will slam which is not good okay so we need to do something so you need to slow the door down as it speeds up and the easiest thing is to use something like a hydraulic damper so with a hydraulic damper if we go back here say the door is flying in we'll go back here again so suppose the door is flying in it's 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 got a big velocity it's coming at speed here the damper will oppose the motion so the damper will go on the opposite side uh, opposite direction to the velocity to slow it down okay so so with the force due to hydraulic damper proportional to speed um in fact velocity that should say the force of the hydraulic damper will be given like this so this is the the damping force it's proportional to the velocity so it's some constant times the velocity but because it goes in the opposite direction to the velocity you get a minus now you write there Newton's second law which says that the mass times the acceleration in any particular direction is equal to the sum of the forces in that direction and if you know that the acceleration is the rate of change of velocity which means the first derivative of velocity and velocity is the first derivative of displacement you will find that the equation of motion reads the mass times the acceleration which is the second derivative of position now we're still going to have the spring to close the thing but now we're also going to have the damper now i'm going to write the velocity as the rate of change of uh, displacement so be dx dt so this is the differential equation that we're hoping to solve and it can be shown that if you choose k and lambda appropriately you can get a door that closes automatically closes gently without slamming and closes quickly so really you're trying to design um this is called the damped harmonic oscillator you're trying to balance lambda off with k if lambda is too small which is called underdamped the you're not going to slow the door down enough and it's going to slam if now that's if, if you want to say lambda is too small instead it's equivalent saying the spring is too strong alternatively if lambda is very big then what's going to happen is the um if lambda is big then if the door gets moving at all the damper is going to slow it down and it's going to take the door ages to close that's the same as the spring essentially not being strong enough there is a happy medium it's not when they're equal but there is a happy medium where you've got a relationship between the damping and the spring so that it doesn't close too quickly and it doesn't cl close too slowly it closes just right and that's called critical damping now if we go back for a moment and talk about the over damping uh, if you're over damped yeah that's the door that you see it closing quickly and then it takes ages it, it just kind of creaks the creaking door that's over damped a door that slams into the door frame or if there's no door frame oscillates that's under damped I want to avoid those situations equations of this form where you've got a, a multiple of the second derivative plus a multiple of the first derivative plus constant times the function you're looking for turn up all the time for example in electronics you have also seen one um strictly speaking in your beams so it doesn't look like it but you've ei 
times, well, it's not exactly this form because we're not going to have zero on the left hand side, the fourth derivative. But it'd be plus zero times the third derivative, plus zero times the second derivative, plus zero times the first derivative, plus not zero times the function is equal to minus w of x. So these, uh, your beam equations are of the same uh, form. I think we're going to learn a bit more about that in the second chapter. That's another one where the um, multiple of the first derivative is zero and the multiple of the function is zero as well. Okay. Now, one thing that will um, you don't have to do in this chapter, but you definitely have to do in the next chapter is be able to factorize quadratics. This is something you did when you were probably 14 in school. Um, and I would get I would guess that you would have been shown a particular way, which was a good way. And then suddenly, for some unknown reason, the teacher started factorizing quadratics. Now, maybe let's write down what a quadratic is. So functions which can be written in the form q of x equal to ax squared. So you got an x squared, definitely maybe an x and or a constant. Factorizing these yokes. So for example, x squared minus 1, factorize that. x squared plus 4x plus 4, factorize that. Or x squared minus 9x, factorize that. So these are all uh, examples of quadratics. And factorizing these is very important in the next chapter. In the next chapter, we must be able to factorize these. Factorize means write it as things multiply together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what's called what I call the AC. Well, sorry, I don't call it. Well, I call it, but it is in general called the AC method. And a lot of you would have been shown this in school, but suddenly they just stopped and you did it in their head. So what you do is um, now we're going to be working with ors, so that's why I've changed it here. So you've got the AR squared and you've got the middle term. What you're going to do is you're going to look at the factors of AC and try and write the middle term BR in terms of, uh, so you want to find things that multiply together, K by N to give you AC and add together to give you B. Um, so you get plus... So you'd be rewriting the BR as KR plus MR plus C. And this you will be able to factor because uh, you'll have a common factor R in the first thing, AR plus K. And then I think because C is a multiple of um, M or so, well, look, it doesn't really matter, but I'm just saying you, it can work. Sorry. It always works if you do it this way. We'll see it with examples. And this is probably how you might have done it in school and then this suddenly stopped. I will need you to be able to do this. Um, although we can probably say, um, if you're doing it in an assignment, if you really wanted, you could, like, I mean, this is this is second year in school stuff. But this, okay, let's, let's sorry, stop, stop, stop being condescending. Let's do, let's do some examples. Okay. So AC, so A here is C and C is minus one. So I multiply those together, I get minus six. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the factors of minus six. Now I'm gonna forget about the sign for a moment. I'm gonna do one by six, two by three. Now I don't have to look at three because I've already got three. And if you get to that kind of a scenario, you're done. Sorry about the dog, nothing I can do about it. Um, now what we want to do is we want to get a pair of these that multiply to give you minus six and add up to give you one. And if you look at it, uh, minus two plus three will do the job. So I'm going to rewrite that middle term. So I get six r squared. So equals, I mean, this, this is equal to six r squared and I rewrite the um, r as minus 2r plus 3r and then uh, minus 1. Now you might say oh why are you factorizing these just use the minus b formula. I'm not solving these equal to 0 in the next chapter. I'm genuinely just factorizing. 
I need to be able to just factorize. It is possible to factorize via the minus b formula, but I strongly don't recommend it. Uh, you go into uh, structural engineering next year, you need to be able to factorize these and never get it wrong. Okay, so what you do now is you take something common out of the first two. Uh, what I mean by the first two is these. And what's common to these is they both have a multiple of 2r. So I take out a common factor of 2r. And what am I left with? 2r by what gives me 6r squared? Well, 2 by 3 gives me the 6, and r by r gives me the r squared. And now what by 2r gives me the minus 2r minus 1? Now what you have to do is take something out of the second 2 that leaves 2r minus 1 again. And the only option here is 1. So 1 times 3r minus 1 does the job. Now you can be guaranteed if you do the, if you pick the uh, if you do the factorizing properly and rewrite the thing properly, it's guaranteed to work from here. And what you're looking out for is that you have uh, a common factor now between these two. So you take out that common factor, which is three r minus one, and what are you left with? You're left with uh, times two r plus one. So you have factorized this. You've written as things it has things multiplied together. So we'll do uh, another example. So this is a mathematical background for uh, this chapter two and chapter three. So the AC is minus 24 here. So we look at the factors of 24. So you do one, two, three and work from there. So one by 24, two by 12, three by eight, four by six, five doesn't go, six I already have, so I have everything. And I need to make up 10 with a, uh, a pair of these that multiplies to minus 24. So I could do plus 12 minus two. That multiplies to minus 24 and adds up to 10. I can't do plus four plus six because that, um, they multiply to plus 24, that doesn't work. So I'm gonna rewrite the plus 10 R in terms of minus two R and 12. So the 3r squared plus 10r minus 8 is equal to 3r squared. And now how about that 10r? Well, that's equal to minus 2r plus 12r. That's equal to 10r. So the equals is justified. Minus 8. And now I take what's common out of the first two. So what's common to the first two is r. What am I left with? Or by what gives me 3r squared? Or by 3r gives me 3r squared. Remember all the time you can pause and rewind. And then r by what gives me minus 2r? It's minus 2. Now, now what you have to do is take something out of the second two that leaves 3r minus 2 again. And you're, if, you, if you do the red bit correctly, this is guaranteed to work. So what's common to 12r and minus 8? How about 4? Does that work? If you tried 2, it wouldn't work. You get 6r minus 4. You have to be able to get 3r minus 2 twice. So 2 doesn't work. You have to take more. You have to take 4. 4 by 3r gives me 12r. And 4 by minus 2 gives me that. And that's exactly what I wanted. So now I take out the common factor of 3r minus 2. And what am I left with? r plus 4. I have factorized that quadratic. Okay, I think we're going to do one more. Yeah. So I'll do this a bit faster because we've seen some. So we'll multiply the a by the c, the 12 by the minus 5. So that's minus 60, which has loads of factors. 1 by 60, 2 by 30, 3 by 20, 4 by 15. 5 by 12, 6 by 10, 7 doesn't go, 8 doesn't go, 9 doesn't go, 10 is already there. Can I make up minus 4? Yes. If I do minus 10 and plus 6, they will multiply to give me minus 60 and up to, add up to minus 4. So we get equals 12r squared. And now that minus 4r is equal to plus 6r minus 10r and the minus 5 is still lying around take out everything we can out of the first two now 2r isn't enough i'd say 
you need to take everything out. You can take more than two, you can take three. Or what are you left with? Three R times what gives you 12 R squared? Well, three by four gives you the 12 and R by R gives you the R squared. And three R times what gives you the six R two. And now you need to take something um, out of the minus 10 R minus five to get another four R minus two. And I might have to think, and in fact, the more I look at it, I realize, has something gone wrong here? No, can't be gone wrong. I'm gonna pause. Aha, dumbass here. I kept saying you have to take everything. You can take more than three, there's a six. Take six. Sorry if uh, I've kind of messed up your own notes. So you take out six and six R times two R gives you that. Yeah, so it's very important you take as much as you can. So we need to get a second two R plus one here. And that's a little bit easier because you can take out minus five. That'll do the job. I wonder with the four R plus two, could you take out like, I think you could take out five over two, but obviously that's uh, nasty. And now what's common to these two is two R plus one. And you're left with 6R minus 5. Okay, and one more. Factorize this. So again, we multiply the A by the C. So that's the 2 by the 9, and we get 18. Look at the factors of 18. 1 by 18. 2 by 9. 3 by 6, 4 doesn't go, 5 doesn't go, 6 we've already got. Can we make up minus 19? Yes, we can if we do minus 1 and minus 18. So let's rewrite. So this is equal to 2 lambda squared. And let's rewrite the uh, minus 19 lambda as minus lambda minus 18 lambda. That's equal to minus lambda, 19 lambda. And it does the job on the right-hand side as well plus nine. Take something out of these two, all I can see is lambda. Lambda by what gives you two lambda squared? Well, you'll need a two to get the two and then lambda. And then lambda by what gives you minus lambda minus one. And now you need to take something out of minus 18 lambda plus nine to get another two lambda minus one. You have to be able to get the same thing twice. And what will do the job here is minus nine because minus nine by two lambda gives you minus 18 lambda and minus nine by minus one gives you plus one. Now you take out your common factor there in yellow. You get two lambda minus one times lambda minus nine. Now what have we actually done in this little lecture here is we have actually only introduced intro to chap chapter uh, two. We've shown where these equations come from. These, what are called damped harmonic oscillators, um, where you've got a multiple of the second derivative plus a multiple of the first derivative plus a multiple of the uh, function equal to zero. And we've said that quadratics are going to be important. Now, actually the factorizing of quadratics is more important in chapter two, chapter three, excuse me, uh, but what we should do, therefore, is practice any factorizing that uh, in this chapter. Okay, I think that's enough for intro.